let's go ahead and dig in. Let's dig into the word of God. Did you know that the Bible predicted hundreds of years before it happened the following? It predicts the baptism of Jesus Christ. It predicts the death of Jesus. It predicts Jewish nation rejection of Christ and the investigative judgment. Don't you know the Bible actually teaches that? And we're going to learn more as we study about as we go into the sanctuary. We've learned in Psalm 77 verse 13, Thy way, O God, is where? In the sanctuary. Who is so great a God as our God? So God's revealing when that victory is in the sanctuary. And we can have victory through Jesus Christ in the sanctuary. The path to the throne, we learn how to have victory over sin from the, from the alt, altar burnt offering all the way to the holy place. God's pathway. The pathway to God's throne, the victory over sin. There are seven festivals that's associated with the sanctuary message of salvation of God, that, for God's people. We've learned about the Passover. We went through details, and we understand that well, that was fulfilled. We look at the type and the anti-type. Remember again, when we say type, we're talking about the, the symbolism, and then the anti-type is the fulfillment of that symbolism. So we saw here the Passover, the actual feast they had, and it was fulfilled. The, the feast of unleavened bread, and it was fulfilled. The feast of first fruits, it was fulfilled. Pentecost, also known as the 50th day, it was fulfilled. The feast of trumpets, it was fulfilled. We also saw the day of atonement. And last couple of weeks ago, we looked at the day of atonement, the type. And today, we're going to see the anti-type and see that it was fulfilled. And notice again, each one of these, these feasts were fulfilled, prophetically fulfilled in chronological order. Each, every, sing each and every one of them, it was fulfilled in chronological order. And then we see the only feast that has not been fulfilled yet is a feast of tabernacles that will be fulfilled. So you can just see, looking at the feast, six of them been fulfilled. We only got one more left. That should tell you something. So today we're going to look at the Day of Atonement anti-type, the fulfillment. Today we're going to look at a message that 99% of the world and in churches have no clue. But God has gifted this message for us for the Seventh-day Adventist movement to give this message to a world. And we must give it. God has gifted this to us. And we're going to look at the Day of Atonement, the fulfillment of it. The Day of Atonement, we're going to see again, remember, this is a re review, we're going to see how Christ cleanses us from sin. The Day of Atonement illustrates how Jesus cleanses us from sin. Remember John, 1 John 1, 9, it says what? If we confess our sins, he, Jesus, is faithful and just to forgive us our sins. And he didn't say stop right there. Now, if he said stop right there, we still got a problem. Because even if I did you wrong, and I say, I'm so sorry I did you wrong, I stole your purse or whatever, and I gave it back, and you forgive me, right? Yeah, I forgive you. I forgive you. I won't hold, in other words, I will not hold that against you. I forgive you. But something you can't do is cleanse me. And this is what Jesus does. He says, I'm going to cleanse you from sin as if you never sinned before. And the day of atonement, teaches us, illustrates to us how he does cleanse us from sin and all unrighteousness. That's what we're going to look at. So again, let's review the Day of Atonement, the type. Let's look at the type. Now remember there's two phases in, in the sanctuary. There was the daily, the daily service and the yearly service. And we know every day, every day, that they had different types of sacrifices. We study the sacrifices. But the sin sacrifice and the trespass sacrifice, they had to take a lamb. They had to take an animal. And if I sin, I took it into the courtyard before the burnt offering, altar of burnt offering, or also known as the altar of sacrifice. And I got the knife, I cut his throat, the priest caught his blood. Now, Every day they symbolically transferred the sin. Remember, you transfer your sin. You had to lay your head on, a, on that sacrifice. Symbolically transferring your sins from you to the animal. 
And then the sin was transferred from the altar to the holy place. Now they either did it two ways. Either the priest would eat the meat in the holy place. That's normally from a individual sins. They would eat the actual flesh in the holy place of that sacrifice. Or for especially for congregations, a congregational sin, they would sprinkle that blood before the veil right here in the holy place. They sprinkle the blood. That was symbolically again transferring the sin into the holy place. Now notice the sin didn't go anywhere. It's actually been now went from you to the animal, from the animal to the holy place. Symbolically. But then we learn that there's a there's a feast once a year known as the Day of Atonement. The Day of at one the Day of Judgment. Now all of Israel knew when the Day of at one came that they were to humble themselves. But the Lord prepared them for that time. Ten days before they had the Feast of Trumpets. We talked about that in detail, so I won't go through that now. But ten days they knew it was ten days before the cleansing. That means the cleansing of the sanctuary symbolically cleansing those sins that went from the, from, from the animal into the holy place. It's there. Symbolically cleansing it out of the sanctuary once a year, known as a day of atonement. So that when the trumpets blew, they knew 10 days from now, the day of atonement. They knew that they had to humble themselves before the Lord, but one thing they had to realize, they had to ask themselves, Lord, Am I forgiven? Lord, have I, have I taken back that sin? Lord, have I truly, truly meant what I said? How are you going to take it back? It was a very humbling time. So you read the details. I won't go over it now, but you can read the details of the Day of Atonement. You find that in Leviticus chapter 16, verses 1 through 34. And you also find that in Leviticus chapter 23, 26 through 30. But let's look at a few key things here. We know the Day of Atonement, the actual type. It was the tenth day of the seventh month. The first day of the seventh month was the Feast of Trumpets. Ten days later, you had the Day of Atonement. It was a ceremonial Sabbath. Nobody did any work. In other words, for us, it's like a holiday, so to speak. Did any work. Also, it was a day of affliction and reflection and humility. I got to reflect. Lord, have my, all my sins been forgiven, Lord. Bring all these things back for remembrance, Lord. And all your focus is on who? God. And God only. And for us, Jesus Christ, of course. Now, what was the meaning of atonement? Now, we know the, the meaning of atonement in the Hebrew means to cleanse, to purge away. That's why it's known as a day of cleansing. To purge. And the Jews or the Hebrews call it the Yom Kippur because atonement means Kippur in original Hebrew. Kippur. So it's known as Yom Kippur. And they still celebrate it today. Yom Kippur. But the meaning is not the same like it is today. It's more, I guess, festive. But it's really a day of humility. It's not really a festive type of day where a lot of celebration is going on at all. When you, when we, when you are separated and cleansed from sin, you are at one meant with Jesus Christ. When sin is cleansed from our soul, cleansed from our life, we are now one with Christ. Now we understand that what separates from us from Christ? Sin separates us from Christ. Sin is enmity between uh, Christ. So if I have sin in my life, I cannot be connected with Christ. But what, what this day of cleansing does, when Christ cleanses from our sins, we now become one with Christ. Just like Jesus was one with the Father, right? We also understand that this day of atonement was not only just cleansing, but it was a time of judgment. Remember, each individual had to reflect upon their own life. But the records, now you have to understand, all those sin that's in the most holy, in the holy place, there's a record with that. And each one is being looked over. Have you reclaimed that sin back? Remember when Jesus asked Peter, he asked him three times, Peter, do you love me? Now, he could have just asked him once, but it was a ref it's for Peter, for he can himself can reflect. Peter, do you love me? Peter, do you love me? Yes, Lord. Yes, Lord. You know I love you. Yes, Lord. To reaffirm or reconfirm in his own soul that is wiped away. 
That day of atonement was a time of judgment, a time of investigation to see if every sin that has been recorded has been repented of and confessed and forgiven. The day of atonement is a process of cleansing. The process of what? Cleansing. Do you really want to have total victory? In other words, it, it reveals if you totally had victory or not. And we know the Day of Atonement, not only did the priest have to have an atonement for himself, but we know they had two, they had two goats. One was known as a scapegoat, and one was known as the goat to be the atonement, the goat, the goat that was going to be for the atonement. And we know they cast lots for it. They cast a lot, and we know the lots didn't throw any dice. They had, actually, it was, it was two, um, it could be two pieces of wood. One said scapegoat, one said atonement goat, or it said the Lord. And they just put, put their hand in that box, and they pulled out one. And the one they pulled out for the right hand goes for the, whatever they picked out, said scapegoat. The one on the right is going to be scapegoat. Pick the other one. The one on the left is going to be the Lord, for the Lord. We know that, say for instance, the one that's for the sacrifice represents, of course, Jesus Christ. His blood, after the sacrifice was given, that blood was sprinkled before that priest went into the high priest. Only the high priest can do it. He goes into the most holy place. And he sprinkles that blood that's from the animal, the Lord. He sprinkles it seven times before the Lord at the altar. And then that was known as cleansing the holy place. In other words, he transferred the sins that were here. Now it goes here before the holy place. That was known as cleansing. But then it wasn't done yet. But then they also, to, so we see the cleansing of the holy place, he goes before the, before the Ark of the Covenant. But then he also went to the altar and he put it on the horns. The same blood that comes from that goat, known as the Lord, the one that represents the Messiah. All right? Once a year. And that cleansed the outer court. But then... The question is asked, what happens to all those sins? What happens to it? It goes back to the original owner. And that is known as the scapegoat. So symbolically, the priest now, he puts his hand on that scapegoat, symbolically transferring all those sins to the scapegoat. And this scapegoat, they take this man who is very healthy, running way out in the wilderness, and let the scapegoat go. And that scapegoat has all the sins. And again, this is prophetic too, because this points to who is the originator of sin? Satan himself. And Satan himself, all those sins are going to go back upon the originator of sin, and that's Satan himself. Because the sin got to go somewhere. And we see that God, this is God's way of dealing with sin. Yes, his blood, he died for our sins. But them sins are going back to his original owner. Amen? Happy Sabbath. Amen. So it's going back to the scapegoat. And we know Satan himself is that scapegoat. And we're going to learn about that later on in the end time where Satan will be that scapegoat where all those sins are going back unto him. For those who chose Christ though. But those who have not chosen Christ, they will die in their own sin. But those who have chosen Christ, those sins had to go somewhere and it goes back to the originator. Now, when is the fulfillment of the day of atonement? In other words, now we're looking at the anti-type. Now, this is the message that the whole world needs to understand. Because if we understood this message, our whole attitude, everything will have will change. Every other thing in life will not be as a priority as we think it would be. The cares of this world will not be a priority at all. Because we understand that we are now living in a time of at one or the time of judgment. But let's look at the anti-time. When is it? In other words, that cleansing of the sanctuary is also known as a day of judgment. The cleansing. Now remember, we just learned the day of atonement is an illustration of how God cleanses us from what? Sin. And I cannot have total victory over sin if I'm not cleansed from sin. Now back 
in Daniel. God has given Daniel the ability to understand visions and dreams. He was a captive in Babylon. And he stood up for Christ. But in that time he was in Babylon, God gave him understanding of what's going to happen in the last days. So Daniel understands the vision. God gives Daniel a, a vision. We gave it to Nebuchadnezzar, and but gave him the understanding of the vision in Daniel chapter 2. In Daniel chapter 2, he's given a vision of all the different kingdoms of the world and God's everlasting kingdom. He sees his image, his great image. In Daniel chapter 7, he's given the same, he's given a vision again about the same kingdoms, but more details. He sees these, these, all these other animals, the lions with wings and the bear, bear with three ribs in his mouth. And he sees his leopard with four heads. And he, then he sees this dreadful beast. In the end time, this dreadful beast, he, he does some terrible things to the saints of God. This, this beast, it, but what comes out of this beast was, well, was, this beast was dreadful, but what comes out of this beast is even more dreadful. And it was a horn, this little horn. But he also learned about, in Daniel chapter 8, he learned more details about those other, the kingdoms of Greece and the kingdoms of Media, Persia, and Greece. He learned more details about them. That Media Persia is about to lose out to Greece in the future. He sees all these things in vision pointing to the end of time. Now you can imagine, see we know, we've seen those kingdoms today rise and fall. So it's for us we see, wow, that happened, that happened, that happened. But one thing that continued to stay on Daniel's mind though, was this, this beast, right? What comes out of that dreadful beast it's this little horn that raises up out of this dreadful beast. It had ten horns. And let's go ahead and look at this to get the whole context. But remember, again, we're going, to be going to under, we're going to be understanding what the Day of Atonement is all about. But in order to understand that, we've got to get the total context of what's going on. Because we're going to find something very interesting in Daniel. Because it talks about a cleansing of the sanctuary. But let's look at Daniel chapter 7. Daniel chapter 7. Interesting, interesting here. So he's seeing all these things in vision, but again, he's, he's, he sees this dreadful looking beast and coming, these horns that come out. So let's go to Daniel chapter 7. Daniel chapter 7. I got to move through this quickly. Daniel chapter 7, verse 8. Verse 8. I considered the horns, and behold, there came up among them another little horn, and before whom there were three first horns plucked up out of his roots. Behold, in this horn were eyes, eyes like a man, and speaking great things. Now, again, this perplexed him when he saw this horn in vision. Now, this horn was symbolic. And he sees this horn, but this horn was, uh, was kind of unique. It's speaking great things. And he's, again... God gave him a vision of all the kingdoms that will rise and fall, rise and fall, all the way till the end of time. But before that, he sees this little horn that's going to come on the scene right before the end of time. And he learns more about this little horn again in Daniel chapter 8. He learns some things about this little horn. Now Daniel receives his vision, he's learning some things about this little horn. In Daniel chapter 8, verse 9 through 13. And out of them, one of them, came forth a little horn, which waxed exceedingly great, forward toward the south and toward the east and toward the pleasant land. And it waxed great, even to the host of heaven. It cast down some of the hosts and the stars to the ground and stamped upon them. These stars are the messengers of God. And what did this, what did this, what did this horn do? It stamped on them. And he magnified himself even to the prince of hosts. And by him the daily sacrifice was taken away and the place of his sanctuary is cast down. And a host was given against him against the daily sacrifice by reason of transgression. And it cast down the truth. What did it do? Cast down the truth to the ground and it practiced and prospered. Again, this is pointing to this little horn in that last day. This little horn. 
towards the end of time. Matter of fact, when Daniel was given a vision, God said, I'm going to show you the, the visions of what's going to happen in the end of time. Taking us through all these various kingdoms, Babylon, Media, Persia, Greece, Rome. And then we see later on that comes on the scene, Papal Rome. Papal Rome. But we don't go into detail right now. But the interesting thing, let's go to verse 13. But so he's seeing these various things in vision. And it's kind of perplexing him some. And you see in verse 13, then I heard one saint speaking. Now remember, he's in vision. And he's seeing these two saints talking to each other. And then I heard one saint speaking, and another saint said unto, said unto, said unto that certain saint which spake, How long? What's the question? How long shall be the vision concerning the daily? And this says sacrifice, but actually if you understood in the original, it's just daily was there. No sacrifice was written in the original transcript. But concerning the daily sacrifice and the transgression of desolation, to give both the sanctuary and the host to be trodden underfoot. In other words, how long would this, this, this horn just walk around and do what he's doing? How long would it be until... Uh, the, 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 this guy will receive his judgment. How long will it be? That's the question. How long? We all have questions like that, especially if you saw a vision like that. When you want to know, how long, Lord? What, what, when is it going to happen? When is it going to take place? Even the disciples said, when the Lord said that this, not one stone will be left upon another. What did they say? Lord, when is this going to happen? So in, in, in vision, Daniel seeing this, and these two guys are talking in vision. How long? When's he going to receive his judgment? Because this, 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 this dude is bad. He thinks he's God. And then he, he thinks he's God and he's trampling on God's people. But understand this. Understand this is very important. In a regular court and even in a court of heaven, there's two phases of judgment. Two phases of judgment. There's the investigative phase, which you investigate the case. And then there's the execution of the judgment. Guilty or not guilty. Now, of course, if you're guilty, then the execution of that judgment will be jail time or whatever was, was decided. Whatever that execution is or whatever that punishment is. That's the execution part. So you have the investigative part where you actually do the... Go through the whole, get the weight of the evidence, look at everything, check out, look at all the records, look at the law, weigh them all out, and then there's a decision made, and then there's an execution of the judgment. Very important. Now, Jesus is given all authority to investigate and execute judgment. He is given that all authority to not only execute the judgment, but to what? Investigate the judgment. Now, let's look at this in Scripture. John 5, 22. For the Father judgeth no man. Talking about God the Father. But he hath committed, what? All judgment to who? The Son. Talking about Jesus Christ. So Jesus Christ has given all judgment. And we we're going to see later on in Daniel, we're actually going to see this judgment scene in action. Or we're going to see him actually be given this right to judge the world. Because he's earned that right, right? He died for our sin. And in verse 27 it says, And hath given him authority to what? Execute judgment also, because he is the son of man. So not only Christ is given authority to investigate judgment, but he's also given authority to do what? Execute the judgment. So we see both. So understand there's two phases again. There's an investigative phase and an executive phase, or execution phase, executive phase I should say. An executive phase. Now let's look at this investigative judgment scene. Now remember in the middle of this vision that, that, John, that Daniel sees in Daniel chapter 7. And he's seeing the vision of these weird looking beasts, the lion and the bear and the leopard and this dreadful, dreadful looking beast that he can't even describe. And that's horn and his little horn comes out. But it, let's look at this again because in the midst of this he reveals a judgment. Because notice at all in these scenes in Daniel chapter 7, he reveals a judgment. In Daniel chapter 8, he's going to reveal a judgment because the question is asked, when is this stuff going to take place? He's going to reveal a judgment, an investigative judgment. So we see here in Daniel chapter 7, verse 8. Let's look at it, 8 through 14. I considered the horns of beheld 
there came among them another little horn, before whom there were three of the first horns plucked up by the roots, and behold, in this horn were eyes, eyes like a man, speaking great things. And I beheld, so he sees this horn speaking great things, and then all of a sudden the scene kind of changes, because he beholds as he's looking at this vision. I beheld till the thrones were cast down and the ancients of days did sit. Now who is this ancient of days? God the Father. The ancient of days did sit whose garment was white as snow and his hair was like a head like pure wool. His throne was a fiery flame and his wheels as burning fire. So imagine in your mind the throne, the ancient of days sitting on his throne. A fiery stream issued and came forth from him. Thousands and thousands ministered to him. And ten thousands times ten thousands stood before him. And the what was set? And the judgment was set. And the what? Books were open. So we see here books are open. Judgment is set now. Investigation has began. But it doesn't stop there. Because we're going to see a transference going on right in a, in a little bit. Judgment is set. The books are open. So we know we're in court. And beheld then because of the voice of the great words which the horn spake. I beheld even the beast was slain and the body destroyed and given to the burning flame. As concerning the rest of the beasts, they had their dominion taken away. Yet their lives were prolonged for a season and a time. And in the night visions I behold. One like the Son of Man come with the clouds of heaven and came to the Ancient of Days and they brought him near before him. So notice again, you see the Ancient of Days sitting on his throne. That's God the Father. The books are, are open. Judgment is set. And we see in vision now that now the Son of Man, who's the Son of Man? Jesus Christ. Now he comes before the Ancient of Days. Now he's before the Ancient of Days. He comes before the Ancient of Days. In the clouds of heaven. He comes. They meet. In verse 14. And there was given. There was what? Given him dominion and glory and a kingdom that all people and nations and languages should serve him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion which shall not pass away in his kingdom that shall not be destroyed. So now we see God's, God the Father said, here son, now, you know like the judge, the, the gavel that judges have? Said, son, this is yours. You have all dominion, authority.